Hey everyone, welcome back. This is the second call that I'm having with Chuck Black. I'm based in Oxford in the United Kingdom. Chuck's based in California. So forgive us if there's a bit of delay on the call or we have other technical issues. Hopefully we won't have any on this call. So Chuck, how is life in California? Take me out to California. Uh, it's uh, sunny as usual. It's a little bit foggy today, but uh, not to rub it in, David, but the weather's quite nice here. It's supposed to be 88 degrees, which is very comfortable in California. So Amazing how hot it is in the UK. We're having a heat wave at the moment, so we're all dying of the heat here in the UK for <laughs> once, but I, I can't complain. So Chuck, I, one of the questions I had, and it might not be relevant, but you hear all this hype about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is going to take away our jobs. Artificial intelligence is going to change networking. It's going to change everything. Do you have an opinion about that? Is it hype or is it reality? Yeah, so uh, taking a step back from that question, uh, you know, uh, computers and software are taking away a portion of uh, the jobs that we have done in the past, right? I mean, we have software to do so many different things that makes our life easier or our jobs easier. So we always have to stay, you know, current, uh, understand what the trends are, whether those are, you know, huge life-changing trends, like from a typewriter to a word processor, or whether it's just an incremental change where something that I had to do manually before is now done in an automated software-based manner. So that's always going to be happening, you know, I'm sure for all of our lives where there will be those uh, types of improvements. Artificial intelligence has been around since I was just a wee lad. So uh, in the in the early 60s, they had artificial intelligence uh, that was being built in labs at places like MIT in the United States and elsewhere where they were teaching a computer to learn calculus. And they had so much success with that, they were predicting, okay, artificial intelligence is going to take over the world. And what they found after a few years is that, yeah, maybe they were able to teach the computer to do calculus, but unfortunately, it still couldn't have like the cognitive functions of a one or two year old child. And that's a lot yeah. more difficult. So we've thought that artificial intelligence in some way, shape or form was going to take over for a while. It hasn't. Uh, of course, as I mentioned earlier, computer uh, software and advancements in that realm have made our lives significantly different. Now, the latest uh, buzzword with respect to artificial intelligence, of course, is machine learning. And that's yeah. the basic idea where uh, you know, it's kind of like artificial intelligence light. It's not thinking like a human, but it's taking uh, responses that either it or something else uh, has had to an occurrence and learning from that. And so uh, that is definitely real and people are beginning to apply that. And that will probably, you know, be a part of our lives in the next decade or so where computers get to actually, you know, I mean, Frankly, computers up to this point in time, they do what you told it to do. And okay. in the future, they will be able to do what you told it to do. And one of the things you told it to do is to learn how to do something a little bit better. And yeah. so, I mean, I'm not sure that I would take um, my advice on this over anybody else's who tries to prognosticate the future, but it seems like we're getting there in incremental steps. But uh, the world of iRobot and, uh, you know, the other science fiction <laughs> things are a little ways away right now. But I do think, I mean, it's a good question because uh, in the world of networking and in the world of anything, <clears throat> you want your software to be smarter. And so software that begins to uh, learn from past events, that will be part of our future in the next, you know, five or 10 years. So do you? Th so you don't think network engineers won't have jobs in the next five to ten years? You 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 reckon this might supplement something, but will still still be needed. Necessary evil, so called. Yeah. So David, you did the classic uh, British double negative on me there. So Sorry. at the very beginning. So I'm trying to parse it out. 
Do I think network engineers will have their job in the next five to 10 years? Yeah, absolutely. Do I think their jobs will be exactly the same as they are today? And when I say that, I mean sitting at a console port or a remote terminal and typing in command line commands to configure your devices. I think that's going to change. And yeah. as we talked about a little bit before in our discussions of software defined networking, you know, we in the networking industry have toyed with the idea of there uh, being this huge change in the way that networking is done, like with OpenFlow, and that hasn't taken root. But what has taken root is the idea that networks will become more driven by software and more automated. And that may be in the form of using NetConf and just API-based SDN. It could be uh, using some tools for automation like Ansible or just writing Python scripts that do screen scraping or talk to uh, some other entity that's running in the device. It, we will be looking at a future where things are more automated. Uh, it, won't, it, it won't be a huge overnight change. And I also, in anticipation of another question, uh, I don't think that every engineer, every network engineer will need to become, uh, you know, a super advanced software developer. I don't think that there's going to be a huge need for that. But what there will be a need for um, and why languages like Python are important is uh, changing all the manual, the things you used to do manually and beginning to build in automation using simple uh, scripts and those scripts will probably be written in Python or Ansible playbooks that are driven by Python or whatever it might be. So I do think that that's, you know, that's in our future in the next handful of years. So Chuck, you read my mind there because I think there's a lot of, how do you say, a lot of in network engineers that are worried about the future because firstly we were told that SDN is going to take all our jobs away. Um, and as you say, SDN has kind of evolved into something else. And now we're still worried that, say, automation will take away all of our jobs. So the first thing you said is you don't think all network engineers need to become programmers. Is, did I understand that right? Yeah, and what, what I mean by that is you're not going to have to drop everything you're doing and enroll in a ton of, you know, like three or four years of retraining yourself on a new skill. I do think that what I see with uh, networking people who have begun to develop software automation is, you know, they just start dipping their toes into the shallow end of the pool when it comes to software development. And they begin to acquire the skills to write software. And they're able to do a whole lot just with a uh, moderate level of uh, capability, but you do need to have some type of good foundation um, in software, but it's not like a multi-year completely retrain yourself on Java and Go and Ruby and all the other advanced languages. So the recommendation isn't to go and study computer science at university for four years or whatever. The recommendation is just to jump in and start learning a little bit about automation. Is that, is that correct? Yep, that's totally correct. I think that, uh, you know, uh, if you acquire the ability to write some software, you know, in a knowledgeable manner, then you will, make, you will be marketable to the people that are thinking of hiring you. And if you refuse to do that, you know, uh, sure, if you're a, a great um network engineer who can program uh, or not program, but configure Cisco and Juniper and Alcatel, Lucent, et cetera, devices, then yeah, you'll be of value to somebody. But if you have that extra software development skill, just a part of it, then I think that makes you way more marketable. Yeah. So from a job point of view, it's better to have like networking knowledge plus some development knowledge than just be a pure networker in the next five, 10 years. Yeah. Correct. I would agree with that. Yep. So you, you're based in California. So in the US, do you, I know, I'm not sure if you even see this. Last time we spoke a bit about jobs. Um, do you see this requirement or, you know, the people that you interact with, they would prefer to have network engineers that have 
at least a basic foundational level of programming knowledge. And moving forward, they th- do hiring people or important people, in other words, like management type people, they, are, are they looking to get network people with programming skills? Yeah, um, so you should take what I say with a grain of salt, right? I'm a, I'm a networking person. I'm also a software development person. I spend most of my time uh, creating networking products that people then use, you know, wireless devices, management, security of those devices. So uh, I'm not speaking as someone who's going out and hiring uh, what used to be network engineers, and now I've changed what uh, I'm looking for. So I'm not that person. But I do interact with a lot of people because, you know, like we've talked about, I've the last five years, I've gone around the world teaching people about software defined networking. And these are people at Cisco, at Juniper, at AT AT&T, at China Telecom, at Alibaba, you know, all over the place uh, in in Europe and South America and Asia, India, etc. So and they're all trying to get people up to speed on software development. So I know that even within Cisco, they're making a big push for their people who work at Cisco to have not only network knowledge, but also have software development knowledge. And as you mentioned uh, <clears throat> earlier, the last time I talked, I believe uh, they had me create this class for customers because the customers are saying, hey, we want to develop our software development. So, um, yeah, s- companies, you know, networking vendors like Cisco and Juniper, Alcatel, Lucent, etc., they're not only retraining their own workforce to become software developers, but they're also uh, offering classes for their customers to retrain the customer workforce to have knowledge of software development. And in these classes that I've taught uh, all over the place, whether it's in China or India or Europe or the United States, um, they are interested in the people that used to have just networking knowledge, gaining an understanding of how to write software. And the people in these classes are not just, um, uh, they're not just the end, you know, they're not just people who already have an inclination towards software, but they're managers, they're people who only know the CLI, they're just about everybody. So I think across the board with the quite a breadth of uh, different domains, people are trying to learn software. So I think that there's definitely value in having that as one of your tools and your skill set as an individual who's trying to advance themselves and, you know, maximize your opportunity for getting whatever job it is that you're looking for. Yeah, so that's really good. So even though you're not a hiring manager, as you said, you're more a techie like me, but you've been training people right. for the last five years from major networking vendors um, and training customers of major networking vendors. And the trend is, as you said, more and more towards training their own staff as well as training customers to learn programming of some description. Is that right? That's exactly right, David. As usual, you have uh, condensed <laughs> and done a fantastic job of concisely saying in uh, three sentences what it took me 47 paragraphs to do. So, yes. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's easy when you, when you just have to summarize what someone's, had to, what, what someone's had to say. So my job's <laughs> easy here. Okay, so I think you mentioned that, you know, Cisco who originally weren't perhaps like an SDN fan, for lack of a better word. That's correct. They have gone full, how do you say, full speed into training their own staff and training customers with network automation or some kind of program programmability thing. Um, and that's what you've seen as well, is that right? Yeah, so even a company like Cisco for whom it is arguably not in their best interest to promote software to find networking because they're doing quite well, you know, thank you very much with uh, networking yeah. the way that it is with their them being a gorilla in the market. But, you know, they want to stay ahead of the curve as well. And consequently, 
they're trying to get uh, their staff and their customers up to speed on um, net, what they call network programmability. So basically the idea is that the network is no longer going to be statically configured, but it is programmable or automatable via these APIs, whether that's using NetConf on the devices, whether it's using screen scraping, uh, whether it's using, you know, something like this uh, BGPLS PSEP plugin for Open Daylight, all those are um, methods by which they're hoping to make their networks more adaptable, more dynamic, and more automated going forward in the future. 